I was living alone for the first time. I was 55 years old with a new girlfriend and new questions about my place in the world, about age, about love and sex and fatherhood, about work and satisfaction. I was also the main caregiver for my 86-year-old mother who moved from her ranch house in New Jersey to an apartment building for seniors in Lower Manhattan after my father's death. It was not a role I performed with much distinction. I did my best to have dinner with her every couple of weeks and accompanied her on the occasional night in the ER. I pretended not to notice that she might want more than that, best to honor her independence, I told myself, and so did she. Neither of us was well equipped for the stage of life we had stumbled into together, she at 86 without an idea of where to find meaning, and me without an idea of how to help. But there we were. One of the first people I interviewed for the series was a woman named Jean Goldberg, 101, a former secretary at Crayola who began our conversation by shouting, Get me a gin! and then proceeded to tell the story of the man who did her wrong, 70 years in the past, but still as near as anything in her life. She was in a wheelchair in a nursing home, but she had lived in her own apartment until she was 100, when she had a series of falls and no longer felt safe on her own. After a great first meeting, she asked to postpone our second interview because she was not feeling well. By the time the new date arrived, she was gone. Whatever strategies she had devised to take her to age 101, humor, I think, but also a stubborn refusal to yield, even when it cost her, were gone with her. Each person had a story to tell about their family lives during the Great Depression or their sex lives during the Second World War, about participating in the Civil Rights Movement or being told by their parents that they weren't college material. But mainly, I was interested in what their lives were like now, from the moment they got up until they went to bed. How did they get through the day, and what were their hopes for the morrow? How did they manage their medications, their children, and their changing bodies, which were now reversing the trajectory of childhood, losing capabilities as fast as they had once gained them? Was there a threshold at which life was no longer worth living? Their qualifications as experts were simply that they were living it. As the British novelist Penelope Lively, then 80, put it, One of the few advantages of age is that you can report on it with a certain authority. You are a native now and know what goes on here. Our experience is one unknown to most of humanity over time. We are the pioneers. I joined them in their homes, on trips to the doctor, in the hospital, in jazz clubs and bars, and a beach house on the Jersey Shore. I met their children, their lovers, doctors, home attendants, friends, and a former district attorney who had prosecuted one for obscenity long ago and who now wanted to apologize. When one suddenly disappeared, his phone disconnected, I tracked him through Brooklyn's hospital system where he was having parts of two toes amputated. I listened and learned. Gradually, I noticed something quite unexpected happening. Every visit, no matter how dark the conversation got, and some days it got quite morbid, raised my spirits like no other work I have ever done. I expected the year to bring great changes in them. I didn't expect it to change me. The six became my surrogate elders. Warm, cranky, demanding, forgetful, funny, sage, repetitive, and sometimes just too weary to talk. They chided me for not visiting enough and fed me chocolates or sent me clippings to read. I changed light bulbs in their apartments and nodded sympathetically about Israel and told them about my relationship with my mother. Often they were admirable. They held grudges and devised Rube Goldberg-type systems for remembering to take their medications, foolproof as long as they didn't drop the little white heart pills which were too small for their fingers and invisible on the floor. With them, I had to give up the idea that I knew about life. It was a humbling experience, but also an energizing one. I didn't have to be the expert or critic challenging the things they told me. Instead, I let them guide me through the world as they saw it.